In general biology, they talked about the phospholipid bilayer. And you have a, a cartoon diagram showing this structurally, that there is a portion of the molecule that interacts very effectively in an, an aqueous or water environment. That is a portion of the molecule that loves water or, or is hydrophilic. So the hydrophilic portion works very well in an aqueous environment. You have to emphasize that biological systems hugely aqueous. We are mostly water. It's the primary ingredient of our structure. Chemical reactions tend to occur in aqueous environments. So anaerobic metabolism, aerobic metabolism, it's happening in water. It's not happening in heptane or hexane. So organic chemists really get focused on different types of solvents. We're, we're living organisms. We work in an aqueous environment, by and large. However, we have lipid. Lipid is a great substrate, but the problem is oils or lipids and water don't mix very well because lipid is a hydrophobic component. So we talk about a polar and a nonpolar. And in chemistry, they'll talk about the fact that you have a charge separation. You tend to have a net negative, net positive shift on this, on this water molecule so that the water has polarity. This is the, the background to why you have your water wells witched. All right, so these people that come out with these twigs or brass rods, purportedly, one of the ways it works is because water is polar, it creates a, 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 a flow of charges which can be measured on the surface using these, uh, these techniques. Now, while my understanding is it's never been documented scientifically, there's hardly anybody that will dig a well without having it witched first. So, so yeah, make that your senior project this year. So we have the polar portions which interact with water. Those are the hydrophilic portion and the nonpolar that form the hydrophobic. It's a bilayer so that you have one set of these cells in one direction, one set of these molecules in one direction, and an opposing set in the opposite direction. And that's kind of diagrammed down in here. But you notice that the polar or hydrophilic ends all face out. So there's the external environment, which is aqueous, and then there's the internal environment, which is also aqueous. Well, what this means is you have a membrane that can regulate and restrict movement of compounds across. That is, you have a way of controlling movement of material in and out of the cell. If the material is all in an aqueous phase, it needs some kind of channel or port. Chemists can make these lipid bilayers just by mixing these compounds in a beaker, adding water, and you'll find that these little micelles or little vesicles form on their own. Well, what's going to distinguish this from a living cell is the presence of these protein channels. And in this bottom diagram, you have cartoons showing the fact that the lipid bilayer is punctuated by the presence of proteins, protein molecules that may be embedded in the extracellular or in the intra cellular surface. So we're going to talk a lot about extracellular, so that's outside of the cell, and we're going to talk about intracellular, inside the cells. So this protein has access really only to the intracellular component. This protein only to the extra, and this protein has this nice little channel or pore through it. Well, if you have an aqueous compound, it's going to be its movement in and out of the cell is going to be facilitated through these uh, channels. 
In addition, you'll notice that there are uh, the mention of carbohydrate, and there's a nice, nice little diagram of a carbohydrate tree on it, what is called a glycoprotein. So all glyco means is sugar, protein, because that's a protein moiety or protein base, but it has attached on it a carbohydrate. It is these structures that give real specificity to the cell. That is, these are the antigens, the, 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 the proteins that we would recognize as foreign or as self. And play an incredible role in immunology. So we will not really focus much on immunology, but I emphasize to all of you the importance of an immunology course in your science futures. Uh, it really is remarkable the amount of immunology that, that's studied and done and its role in disease process and a lot that lies with these specific glycoproteins. So uh, I'm not going to say much more about it other than they're important uh, and they provide uh, specificity to the cell. Plate 8, solute and water movement. So solutes are the compounds which are dissolved. In organic chemistry, the solvent can be organic solvents like heptane. In a biological system, the solute that we're talking about is water. So solute are the dissolved compounds, solvent is water. The movement of compounds is based on their concentration gradient. And the first example of that is simple diffusion. So there's diffusion based on a concentration gradient. Two cells, A and B, separated by a, a membrane. The particles are in higher concentration. The solute is in higher concentration on the left side than on the right side. So there is a gradient, a drive to diffuse from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Diffusion plays a critical role in movement in our cells. Oxygen diffuses, so it diffuses from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. At equilibrium, the number of particles on each side will be equal. So without the advent of some other process, equilibrium means equal concentrations. Bulk flow. Bulk flow is the movement of solutes and solvent based on a pressure gradient. One of the ways we measure pressure is by using a mercury column, so oftentimes pressure is reflected in millimeters of mercury. We talk about blood pressures, we'll talk about millimeters of mercury. You can also talk about pounds per square inch, pascals, atmospheres. They all relate to a driving pressure, to a pump or something which is providing a pressure or a force that is going to move material. Now if we talk about blood pressure and the, the pressure that, it, that the bulk flow of a fluid like blood, that movement is based on forces not on diffusion or concentration gradients. And we'll see how this plays out in the kidney later. Osmosis is the movement of water. So where diffusion was the movement of solutes, osmosis is the movement of water. That means you have a membrane which is uh, becomes impermeable to the solutes. 
that is, the channels or pores are too small to allow, allow the movement. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm up here. The pores are too small to allow the movement of these particles. So in this diagram, we see a competition between diffusion, which would tend to drive the particles this way, and the fact that this membrane prevents that, it restricts that. So what we have done is put an imper a, 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 a a semi-permeable membrane, and that is a membrane that is not permeable to the solutes. So you have restricted diffusion. You still have a concentration gradient. You have a higher concentration of water molecules here than you have here. In the same way that diffusion was driving molecules, osmosis drives molecules, but in this case, they're water molecules. And the movement of water is from a high concentration to a low concentration. When we talk about osmotic drag or osmotic movement of water. It is the movement of water following the solutes. It's the way we perspire. We pump or translocate ions onto our skin. Water is osmotically attracted to that and moves out on the skin. So that's the reason that you have perspiration on your skin. It's also the reason why when you taste it, on your lip, it's salty. Um, ionic currents. So we can have the movement of particles based on their concentration. You can also have the movement of particles based on their charge. That's ionic current. And they, res they move in response to voltage gradients. I'm going to talk a lot about ions, cations and anions. So a gr good example of a cation is sodium. Great example of, a, of an anion is chloride. Now together, these form a very convenient salt. There's table salt, sodium chloride, the primary ingredient of our extracellular fluid in terms of solute, sodium and chloride. When you add that into water, it dissociates, they dissolve, and it produces two ions, one cation, one anion. Well, these anions have different charges. Dissimilar charges attract, like charges repel. So if you have lots of uh, sodium, in this channel and, relic and mostly chloride in this channel, diffusion will tend to make sodium move in this direction and chloride move in this direction. So will the ionic current. That charge is attracted to that charge. So both diffusion and ionic current will tend to drive this to equilibrium. Well, the way that you can prevent that is by putting in another current. So if you make this, uh, if, uh, if you put a positive charge in here, that will tend to repel the sodium. And we'll see that the nerve cells, cells of our bodies, tend to do that relatively effectively. Let's revisit some of these uh, pathways for membrane transport in plate 9. So we have a lipid bilayer, we have a solute, we have channels, we have protein, and then we're going to talk about ATP. The first example is passive transport. Passive transport means that you are transporting compounds without the benefit of energy does not require ATP. One of the ways that particles get through the membrane is through lipid solubility. Now, I, I know I said most of our system is aqueous, most of our biological system is aqueous, but there are a number of compounds which are lipid soluble. DMSO, ethanol, Ethanol has a, a property in which it dissolves both in water and it dissolves in lipid. 
So, ethanol can be used as a carrier to move compounds through cell membranes. It's going to move through cell membranes based on a concentration gradient. So if you apply DMSO or ethanol, it helps carry these particles in. What about aqueous, non-lipid soluble compounds? Well, for that, we can use these protein channels. So the, again, these protein channels puncture the membrane and provide a conduit, a pore, or a channel through which the compound can move. It's passive transport, so that means ATP is not involved. That means that the movement of a compound through the channel is going to be a function of diffusional gradients. So if there's lots of calcium on the outside of the cell and this channel is open, it will diffuse in. It doesn't require ATP, it's passive based on a concentration gradient. But it's being moderated and mediated through this protein. So one of the ways you can regulate the flux of this calcium is by changing this protein, changing the pore and allowing either less or more calcium to go through. Third type of passive transport is what is referred to as facilitated transport. Like the protein channel, it uses specific membrane proteins, proteins which can recognize specific compounds and help channel them and them alone through the membrane. another way of regulating movement across the cell membrane. Well, these are all based on passive concentration gradients. What about moving things against gradients? What if you need to acquire calcium? You don't have an adequate amount. and You need to pull it in. Uh, muscle cells, classic example. They use calcium for contraction. They need to accumulate large amounts of calcium. Well, as they accumulate large amounts of calcium, that produces a concentration gradient. If you've got a lot of calcium in the muscle, it will tend to diffuse. So in order to keep it in there, you must expend energy. That's active transport. So we have passive transport, lipid soluble, protein channel, facilitated transport. Now we have active. And all this means is that it requires the presence of ATP. Transport can be in one direction. It can be one direction with two compounds, or it can be in opposite directions. So in co-transport, you require the presence of two compounds. Good example of that is sodium and glucose. In your gut, you have a number of co-transporter proteins, proteins which pick up sodium. You need salt, right? You need sodium. Glucose, primary energy store, energy source, you want to pick that up. And so we have evolved co-transport proteins in the gut which recognize these compounds and move them together. Now if you knew this, if you'd been studying your co-transport text earlier on, if you wanted to design a drink that helped bring energy in to your body, you wouldn't use just lemonade, you'd add salt to it. Therein lies the Gatorade empire. So if you notice, Gatorade has not only sugars, carbohydrates, but it has ions. This co-transport mechanism picks up those sodiums, picks up those carbohydrates and moves it through. The movement can be in a counter direction. Counter-transport one ion or one compound is moved in one direction and another compound is moved in the opposite direction. 
and, and the best example of that is sodium potassium. We'll talk about those shortly. Next slide. So if we go to plate 10, we're going to spend a little more time talking about the sodium potassium pump. Pump with the idea that energy is involved. So this is an active transport mechanism. It requires ATP and is involved in movement of ions. So I'm going to set up a, a cell for you. And I don't want you to memorize concentration differences. I want you to know relative concentrations. So here's a cell. Oh, here, this is a good, this is my cell right here. So this is intracell, this is extra cell. One component that distinguishes a live interactive cell is a high concentration of sodium in the extracellular environment and a high concentration of potassium in the intracellular. So the major cation outside the cell is sodium. The major intracell is potassium. It turns out that chloride, higher concentration, extra cell, there is chloride in the in, in cell, but it tends to be smaller, so less than. This sets up diffusional gradients. Sodium wants to diffuse in. Potassium wants to diffuse out. If the membrane was totally impermeable, you wouldn't have to worry about these diffusional gradients. But that's not life. There is some leakage. Well, what happens is that this is a characteristic of a living cell. In order to have a functional cell, you must maintain this ion distribution. Well, how do you correct it? You've got some invariable leak, so what you do is you generate and put in a sodium pump. So there is a transmembrane protein, that is a membrane which crosses, a protein that crosses the membrane, whose responsibility it is, is to take the sodium and move it back out. And it is coupled to the potassium to move potassium back in. It's an energy requiring process. So this pump is also sometimes referred to as the sodium potassium ATPase. So it's an ATPase, it's an enzyme that cleaves ATP and is involved in sodium and potassium transport. So in your diagram, you see that there's this movement of, of sodium and the direction is counter to the flow of potassium. It turns out that the amount of leakage is not the same for sodium and potassium. And you think these are, although they're, they're similar halide compounds, they are different sizes, have different permeabilities, and move through membranes slightly differently. So in fact, it turns out that in, in, in normal living cells, uh, the pump, the sodium potassium ATPase, has to move three, AT, uh, th three sodiums in for every two potassium going out. And those numbers are kind of res uh, represented in, in the middle diagram. Functions of the sodium pump. Here's an example of helping a gradient for co-transport. So if it's pumping, 
Right. We talked, our example of co-transport was glucose and sodium. Well, if sodium is leaking into the cell, that's going to counter the co-transport. And it's going to disrupt the gradient for sodium movement. Right. So here's your cell. You're getting lots of sodium in here. That's going to create a concentration gradient that's going to restrict the transport of glucose and sodium in. Right. So sodium is being pumped against a higher concentration of sodium. So you're going to make that easier if you can prevent that sodium from, from rising to high levels. So you need to pump it out. Where we're going to spend some more time is in the generation of bioelectricity, another characteristic of a living cell. If I put an electrode inside of a cell, the inside is relatively negative compared to the external environment. Now, it's not a lot, minus 70 millivolts. Any time you have a voltage change, you have, by definition, bioelectricity. There is the potential for electric current, the movement of electrons, because of a charge difference. Now, in your car battery, it's 12 volts. So it's a relatively large potential difference. But you can use that for bioelectricity to drive lights, to drive the motor, etc. Well, we're going to do the same thing in cells, but we're going to do it on a smaller scale. We're only talking minus 70 millivolts. One of the definitions of a living cell is a cell with a negative potential, a, a, a membrane potential of minus 70 millivolts. So for part of my postdoc, I stuck cells and measured the electrical potential across the membrane. The cells I were working with had uh, like minus 90 millivolts. But what would happen is I would puncture the cell with this little electrode and I would watch the potential go from minus 90 to minus 80 to minus 70 to minus 60 to minus 50. Well, what was happening? The cell was dying. And a cell with no potential difference is a dead cell. So we recognize the need to maintain this potential difference. It is due in large part to this sodium-potassium pump. There are compounds which poison the sodium-potassium ATPase. If you poison the sodium-potassium ATPase, you will kill the cell. So, membrane potentials, plate 11. What is a potential? Well, he's got a lot of potential, but I just don't think he's going to make it. A potential is a charge separation. It is a voltage difference. So a battery has a voltage. There's, there's a separation of charges. There's a plus side and a negative side. We see the exact same thing in these living cells. There is a charge separation. There is low and high voltage. There is a potential across the membrane. So membrane potential, characteristic of all living cells. It is across the, the membrane bilayer been measured by neurophysiologists, and the, and the process uh, seems relatively unsophisticated. You take a capillary tube, pull it out very, very fine to only a couple microns in thickness. You then fill it with electrolyte and stick it a, a, into the cell. You then have a voltmeter that measures charge on one side of the membrane relative to the other. Well, I've told you that a living cell has a potential difference. And this is something on the order of minus 70 millivolts. Well, how does that occur?
we go from a simple membrane with channels. So there are pores or channels that make this membrane permeable. Now, not totally permeable. I told you we want to keep a charge separation. We need potassium high on the inside. So this is the intracellular side, and this is the extracellular side. We need to keep sodium high on the extracellular side and low on the intracellular side. despite this drive to, 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 to push these to equilibrium. So we have different ion concentrations across. We have different permeabilities. So in an intact resting cell, the permeability for potassium is greater than the permeability for sodium. That means that potassium will tend to leak out. So this shows this little channel and the movement of the potassium out. Because the permeability is greater for potassium, you don't get as much sodium in. The net effect is a diffusion gradient drives potassium out of the cell. Well, for every molecule of potassium that leaves the cell, the cell becomes more negative. It's losing a positive, right? So each positive that moves out makes the inside of the cell more negative. This isn't counter. Now, this, this produces an, a, a voltage potential. And if you've got sodium out here, not only is there a big drive for sodium in based on the concentration gradient, that positive also sees the inside a little more negative. So why doesn't the sodium move in? Sodium is prevented because of the permeability. The permeability of the membrane is much, much lower for sodium. So even though diffusional gradients, even though electrical activity, uh, electrical attraction, would tend to pull sodium in. It does not make up for the amount of potassium that's leaking out. So does all the potassium leak out? Well, there's a couple processes at work. One, we talked about the sodium potassium pump. But also, each time a positive leaves, it makes the inside more negative. So in fact, at some point, even though there's a strong diffusional drive for potassium, the inside becomes so negative that it starts attracting potassium back in. Oops, where have I? we have a temporary problem. Yeah, this is making a very poor connection. No? It shows me at 95. Yeah. Why did that happen? I wonder. All right, we're back. Online. Flawless, seamless technology. I, I don't know why I did that. Equilibrium potential. So this diagram shows this flow out of potassium. When the charge is so negative, like about minus 70 millivolts, even though there's a diffusional gradient for potassium, potassium is still high on the inside, and it tends to diffuse out. For each molecule that diffuses out, another one comes back in, attracted because it's so negative. So we talk about this balance between diffusional and voltage. So diffusional is, is concentration gradients. Voltage is electrical. 
in, a, in an intact living cell, there is an equilibrium at which occurs around minus 70 millivolts. Uh, bottom of this, you see the living cell requires a sodium potassium ATPase pump to correct that. and help maintain that bioelectric potential. Now plate 12, 13, 14, I want to uh, skip for a minute, for a moment, and go to plate 15. the nerve impulse. I've already set up a normal cell, a cell that has a minus 70 millivolt resting potential. This potential, this charge separation, gives me the power to do some signaling, some work. And we see that with bioelectric cells, cells that produce electricity. The classic example of that is the nerve cell. I said we're comparative physiology, domestic animals. In fact, the classical work on nerve action potentials and nerve signaling was done on the squid giant axon. So a lot of what we know about how nerve cells function, uh, we owe to the lowly squid. A squid which had axons on the order of uh, or cells that were one millimeter in diameter. Visual. You could see the cells. And then what they would do is they would take these cells and they would alter the chemical constituents. They would take and they would empty out the contents of the cell and replace it with different ions. And they would see how these ions and the change of these ions affected the membrane potential. So let's start with our stylized nerve cell. There's a nice diagram up here, which includes the cell body or soma of a nerve. That's the nucleus right there. There are um, a projection of the cell body. So this is a modification of the normal cell, which is referred to as the axon. The inside of the axon is congruent with the cytoplasm of this cell. Now sometimes it's a little bit different because it's distant from the nucleus. It's distant from a lot of the cellular mach machinery. So sometimes we talk about axoplasm to distinguish it from cytoplasm. But by and large it is relatively the same material. Dendrites are projections of the cell body that are involved in the reception of electrical signals. So information comes into the dendrites, moves through the cell body, and then is projected down the axon. The axon terminates in what is called the axon terminal. And in this example, the, this cell, the axon, is terminating in skeletal muscle. We might refer to this as a neuromuscular junction. So the junction between the nerve and muscle. The electrical signal is sent unidirectional from left to right. So this is how axons carry information. At rest, we find that the cell is polarized. That is, there is a potential. And that's diagrammed right here. The little voltmeter, and you stick the, uh, the electrodes inside and outside, and you see that this cell is 
has a resting membrane potential of, say, minus 70 millivolts. So it's a normal cell. It has uh, it, the normal distribution of ions, potassium high on the inside, sodium high on the outside. A little bit greater permeability for potassium, so potassium leaks out till it's balanced by the voltage, minus 70 millivolts. But what's unique about these bioelectrical cells is that when you stimulate them, you get a change in the membrane potential. The membrane potential goes from negative to positive. Well, this is a means of signaling. Sending a signal, kind of on, off. And how does this occur? So if you look at the first first plate up here, it's describing the, the resting membrane potential. So this is a non-activated neuron, non-activated axon. If you stimulate it, you will see that there will be this very, very brief positive inflection in the resting membrane potential. Well, how do you measure that? You can't do it with a voltmeter. This is a very rapid process in the order of one millisecond. So we did not see the evolution of neurophysiology as we know it until the advent of oscilloscopes, compound, or machines that can measure fractions of a second, microseconds. So with the advent of oscilloscopes and electrical recording in very rapid moments, neurophysiologists were able to record this event. So what they were seeing is that a membrane potential would pass by. It would move by and produce this pulse. Inside is going negative, uh, is going positive from net negative. So you, and you don't have to neurophysiology class make you memorize what this value is. All you need to know is that it goes positive. Well, how can it be going positive? So if we go back and we look at our cell, we said the cell was net negative because Potassium tended to leak out a little bit more. So there's the diffusional gradient for, for, for potassium. There's the diffusional gradient for, for sodium, but sodium is less permeable. There's the diffusional gradient for chloride. It's very impermeable. So in a resting cell, most of the movement is uh, potassium out. Inside becomes minus 70. Well, how can you make this cell more positive. There's a positive charge there. There's a positive charge there. If you were to increase the permeability of the cell to, so let's draw that again. There's sodium. So it's diffusing this direction. And the diffusion of sodium or I'm sorry, of potassium is larger and it's out in this direction. Chloride is like this. I can make the inside of the cell positive by increasing the permeability to sodium. So if I were to change one of the sodium transport proteins and make this hole larger, that is make the membrane more permeable, I would see an influx of sodium. And that's exactly what happens. So we're going to call this an action potential. It's a potential. It's a change in voltage. It's occurring actively. We've stimulated the cell. And we're getting a signal. So the first component of an action potential is an increase in sodium permeability. Now, if you look at the, no the, the units, uh, we're talking milliseconds. Right? If you look up here, this is in milliseconds. 
in a fraction of a millisecond, we see the, the membrane potential go from negative to positive. And that's indicated right here. So at rest, ports are primarily for potassium. In the initial phase of the action potential, you see an increased permeability for sodium. You are allowing sodium then to move in on the basis of its concentration gradients. The next phase of an action potential is a shutting off of the sodium permeability. So think about an action potential being precipitated by a change in the protein transport. It opens up. It allows the sodium to rush into the cell, but when it becomes positive, all of a sudden, it causes a conformational change. So this is my, my, my rule to you is that if you're in, in um, organic chemistry and you don't know the answer, always put down a conformational change occurs. They're bound to give you credit for at least partial credit. So a conformational change occurs in this transport protein. It closes down and shuts off sodium permeability. So sodium permeability is high during the this phase, the depolarization of the action potential. But right up here, it shuts off. And what happens is the cell becomes repolarized. The inside of the cell is becoming more and more negative. So if we go back and we say, all right, why is it becoming more negative? We made the cell more positive by increasing permeability to sodium. If we made the cell more permeable to chloride, then chloride would move in, and that would make the cell more negative. What if we increase permeability to potassium? that is above resting or basal. Well, if you make it easier for the potassium to move out, it will, in fact, move out. It's taking a net positive charge out, so that, in fact, will make the cell, the inside of the cell, more negative. And if you look at this plate right here, no, not at that. That's exactly what's happening. It is an increased permeability to potassium. So that's increase above resting. So depolarization is caused by an increased permeability to sodium. It shuts off at the top. And then permeability to potassium is increased. There is a repolarization. So. Action potential consists of a period of depolarization, a, peri a period of uh, repolarized. And in fact, what happens is the permeability to potassium stays high for a little bit longer. And you see an overshoot. So there's resting membrane potential. Potassium still stays on and leaches out so that it actually becomes even more negative. Charge separation inside of the cell is, more, is negative, so we say that it's polarized. If the inside of the cell becomes even more negative, we say that it is hyperpolarized. That is characteristic of action potentials and axons. You see an action potential come through characterized by a depolarization, a period of repolarization, and then an area of hyperpolarization. 
And the way they've diagrammed it is a progression, that the action potential in this case goes from left to right. That would be left to right, opposite direction that I just did, left to right. Uh, why don't we go ahead and take a break?